All right, we're going to get started. I'm excited to be here with you. There was a dead silence right there. It is a pin drop on here. So, uh, man, again, like Chris said, I am. Uh, my name is Keith. I'm lead pastor here, and uh, I'm excited to be in this. I'm excited about uh, today as we get to explore this. Before we go any further, I want to say a uh, shout out to University of Idaho, uh, go Vandals, and to Central Washington University, uh, go Wildcats. We're excited to have you guys via video as well. And so we are. We're in this series. Uh, we've been talking about this this idea of of how we're created, this design, and specifically over the last couple of weeks, last week and then this week, we're talking about uh, how this looks like for men and how this looks like for women. And, and we're talking about the fact that there's a difference. And, and I want to just hit on some of those differences real quick before we get into this. So I begin to, to, to get on the internet and, and find out what do people say are, uh, are differences. Not yet, not yet. Hold on, hold off, hold off. I'll give you. All right. So uh, uh, I want to give you some ideas about uh, about this. And so, um, first of all, um, when it became to uh, kind of understand who, what is the difference between between best friends uh, when it comes to men and uh, and women? Uh, it says this that diamonds are a girl's best friend. However, dogs are man's best friend. So uh, you can kind of see the difference in who's smarter in that. Definitely women. Uh, in terms of what it looks like in a uh, in a bathroom, a man's uh, bathroom has six items: a toothbrush, toothpaste, shaving cream, a razor, a bar of soap, and a towel. The average number of items in a typical woman's bathroom is 337, of which a man would not be able to identify more than. 20 of these objects. So that might just be a difference. There's, there's an, a difference in like uh, whether or not guys uh, or, or ladies love cats more. And we can say that, you know, def definitively women love cats. Men say they love cats, but when women aren't looking, men kick cats. And so uh, that, that might be a, a part of it. Uh, when it comes to colors and, and for us to understand uh, how women and, uh, and men kind of see the colors differently and how it looks like, I have a, I have a graph for you to kind of illustrate some of this. Yeah. So there you go. Um, there's a lot more basic um, for that. And, uh, and, when it comes to, uh, and when it comes to picking out shampoo, you know, there's, there's two different ways to look at this. One, you can see all the different things. And then, uh, and then the bottom one, it says shampoo. <laughs> how men pick out shampoo, it says shampoo. And so that's, uh, that's kind of how it works in this. But uh, again, I I'm really excited, uh, ladies, to talk to you specifically uh, today about this because uh, I really have some stuff that's been on my heart uh, for a while about this. And, uh, and I don't get a whole lot of opportunities to talk to you. I don't get in in invited all to the to ladies' events. So I'm going to seize today. I don't want to seize this moment to, uh, to be able to communicate um, some things that I think are incredibly important about what God has to say about femininity and about womanhood. Uh, to start this, uh, I think it's fair for you to say, why are you talking to us about this? And what's your context for femininity, Keith? Uh, and so I, I, I'll let you know what my context for femininity. One, I have a mom. So I, I think I have a picture of, yeah, there's my family. And uh, just a, my, my brother looks like he's really angry about something. So uh, also, as you can see, I have a sister. So I have a mom and a sister. Um, and so that's a helpful perspective, obviously. Uh, not only that, but I have a, a wife and, uh, and, and I have a daughter. Uh, and, and I want to, to, to tell you in part, uh, okay, just a second, I'll get to him, okay? Um, I, uh, w when it comes to uh, this, this whole process, what I'm, uh, what I'm seeking is like, how do I figure out how to tell my daughter how to be a woman? Like last week I talked about how is it that, uh, that I teach my, my boys how to be men, uh, and that's overwhelming. But, uh, but then there's a, a picture of, uh, of my daughter here, and she's on the beach. And, and, and so like I say, hey, let me take your picture. And she strikes that pose, and I'm like, oh, no, this is, this is not going to go well. Um, but uh, when it comes to being girly, uh, she has no problem. Here's uh, at the park. Uh, no, here's at her birthday. Um, so there she is, uh, posing for her picture in a frame. Uh, here's another. Uh, here's another photo of her with a massively big bow there. Uh, and then I think I have one more. This is her last week. Uh, my wife says, "Hey, let's go to the park." Um, and so she decides that when she goes to the park, she's going to wear her park attire. And evidently, her park attire is all pink 
with a ring on, with a necklace on, and with a tiara. So uh, this, is, this is my little girl. She is uh, she's 100% girl, 100% pink. There's nothing that you have to do to convince her about this. But the question is not whether or not she's girly or not. But the thing is, as we begin to probe deeper into this, it's not just about wearing plastic tiaras, and it's not just about wearing uh, pink. There's got to be something more that it means to be a woman. There's got to be something more that femininity requires than just wearing pink. And that's where we're at today, asking the question, what is, what is it that's beyond just being a girl that it means to be a woman? And, and for me, this is something that uh, I really want to speak to um, because I think it is incredibly misunderstood. I think that femininity is dramatically under attack. And, and I think that it's so under attack that sometimes we don't realize it because of how far we've drifted from what God has to say about it. There's a push for femininity to look like masculinity. And ultimately the end goal of this kind of, uh, kind of push is for there to be just ambiguity in hum- humanity and humanness. And I think that this is not going to lead us. I believe that this doesn't lead us to human flourishing. That when we take and, and, and make something that's, that's kind of neutered or something that loses its, its specific understanding of masculinity and femininity, it's not going to lead us to flourishing. And I think that we've already established that and we can see some of these things. But the question is, is what is it that it looks like? And, and I believe that you ladies are created with an inherent femininity. And that when you embrace this, it is going to bring clarity and security to your life in a way that allows you to flourish. But I think that right now in our world, it is incredibly difficult for you to be a woman. It is incredibly difficult for a woman to be in our world. There's an overwhelming pressure to look a certain way. And there's a sense of comparison that is so physical that every single girl loses because there's always someone who is prettier. And at the same time that there's that side of it, there's this reaction to what it means to be a woman. And that basically it's saying that you should act like a man and so that you should look like a woman, but you should act like a man. And what that creates in the, in the personhood of a, of a woman is such a dramatic fracture of what it looks like that, that you're really searching, I think, for what does it mean? So I'm supposed to look this way, I'm supposed to act this way, but what does it really mean to be a, to be a woman? What, what, is this, what does this look like? And I think that as we begin to kind of pursue this, for me, I believe it's so much easier to teach my boys how to be boys, and it will be to teach my little girl how to become a woman. Because I think in some ways there's there's a sense that uh, that you women are, um, that there's an an escape from femininity for for some of you. And I think there's two reasons for this. One is that um, maybe in the past you've received negative attention for being a girl, for for being a, a woman. And this is uh, really seen in, in some of these commercials that say, what does it mean to do something like a girl? And there's this negativity that's associated with this, that, that somehow you want to escape femininity because there's a negativity uh, affiliated with that. Maybe that's in your major. Maybe that's with, within other things uh, in your world. But you're not wanting to be feminine because it has these negative con- connotations. But for others of you, there's, uh, there's, you want to escape from femininity because you got a lot of positive attention when you were a girl and that made you uncomfortable, that you were put into positions where your femininity was kind of exposed and that puts you in situations that it didn't make you feel safe. It didn't make you feel secure. It made you feel exploited. And and I think that these are the two things or two of the things that make us kind of decide to not want to press into femininity, but to escape from this. But I want to tell you that this is something um, that is not God's plan. And we started off with God's design. And God's design from, from the very beginning was intentional, was intelligent. And God created all this, and specifically, he created humans. And we see that God created humans in his image, which means that our inherent worth and our value comes from God alone, not from anything that we do, not from our comparison to other people, not because of our gender, but it comes from God alone. In Genesis 1, 27, it says this, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And we have to land here before we can go anywhere else in exploring what it means to be male and what it means to be female. Because God specifically says, I'm going to make humanity in my own image. 
but I'm going to make them male and female, intentionally designed to be different. And so God, you know, pushes this way. And last week, we established that this was deeper than just biology. This was at a personhood level. It means that we aren't just humans, but we are men and we are women and we possess a God-given masculinity and femininity that is given to us by God to reveal God's glory. And so in this, uh, my hope is that we begin to see that the desire of God is that masculinity is to be self-evident and unquestioned. But the truth is, this is not the reality that we live in. We live where masculinity has been distorted. And we live where femininity is, being, is distorted. And it's under attack. And I want us to see how this began. Why is it under attack? Why is it distorted? Because maybe if we can understand what is wrong, we can be under, begin to understand how it ultimately is supposed to look. And before we go any farther, I want you to hear, uh, for, for you, if you're single in this, uh, the Bible is specifically talking, and all of this text and principles are specifically talking in the marriage relationship. So that's what we're going to directly speak to today, the marriage relationship. But I think as you begin to hear this stuff, you can begin to understand that indirectly this affects those of you who aren't, in, uh, who aren't married. If you're single, if you're a single guy, if you're a single girl here, here today, you're, you're going to hear some stuff that begins to say that still is the trajectory of womanhood. This is, this is the essence of femininity, and I think that we'll be able to put this together. But we're going to start with the distortion because I think that that brings clarity to what this looks like. So yes, last week we talked about this. We have the, 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 the creation where it was perfect in the way that men and women were put together. And we see uh, the fall. And last week we got into that specifically on how sin entered the world. And when sin entered the world, it fractured the way that God intended it to be. And now we have this shadow of the way that God intended it to be. And we have the sin that enters into the world and it distorts primarily this understanding of the roles of masculinity and femininity. And I want you to see how core this is. This is not a peripheral topic, but because when we see sin enter into the world, it affects men and women differently. When we begin to see God describe, here's what's going to happen when sin distorts these roles. It's at the very core of how we are, and it's the very core of creation. So if you have your copy of Scripture, you can turn with me to chapter 3, verse 16 of Genesis. And it's going to be up on the screen, and also it's going to be on our app as well. But it says this. So after we see this, this is God saying, this is the description of what it looks like after sin has entered the world. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So I, I want you to see the effects of what sin happens in womanhood. The first thing that you need to understand is that sin affects women in motherhood. Sin affects women in motherhood. And what we can look at, it seems like when we look at this, it seems pretty self-explanatory. However, as I begin to read and do research, most people who understood, most, most Jewish women who understood this text in the very beginning, understood that this curse went beyond the simple act of childbearing and includes the raising of children as well. And this concurs with scripture throughout the New Testament that speaks to the woman's unique capacity and responsibility in raising children. It reads like women will naturally migrate towards feelings of responsibility at their core for the well-being of their children and that the curse of sin affects them in a unique way and that the entry of sin into the world will affect them um, in a way that's significantly different than men. And we attempt to explain this and begin to understand this with words like mother's intuition or that there's something in the heart of a mother that's in some ways different than that which is in the heart of a man. And, and in this, when we begin to see the, the sin affect a woman, there's this idea of bringing children into this world, the nurturing, the responsibility of this, but then the effects of sin on her children are pretty devastating to the heart of a woman. So when she begins to put her effort into raising kids, when, when there's a sense of being felt responsible for this and sin affects her kids, I've seen this over and over. And, and maybe you've seen this in, in mom's calls to you, right? And how mom uh, is checking up on you. And there's a sense by which there's a, a responsibility that's placed on that, that that's seemingly unique in the weight that it falls 
on a woman's shoulders that's different from that of a man. And so when we begin to think about this, um, there's a role that women, and specifically mothers in this, are, uh, are assigned that is one of incredible respect. So, right? So you don't like it when someone talks about your mama. I mean, there's, this, there's a reasons why we have your mama jokes, right? And not just your daddy jokes, because your daddy jokes aren't near as, as funny as your mama jokes, because there's something that strikes in the core of who we are. There's something that, that when, when we hear someone talk about our mama, that, you know, hey, I'm going to that's fighting words, right? Because there's something there. There's a unique aspect of that. So that's the first part of how sin uh, expl- kind of hits that. The second part, we begin to see, and your desire will be for your husband. Now, when we read that, it, that seems like all of a sudden, uh, like something happened, and then all of a sudden, Adam got hot, you know? And so all of a sudden, I, I didn't desire him, but I did. And, you know, so if I think about, it, it almost reads as if the narrative would go like something like this from the woman's perspective. Like, Adam was just this dude, right? And then all of a sudden, he I ate the sin apple. And all of a sudden, I realized he is so hot. Like, there's no one on earth that's sexier than this guy, right? And then he eats the apple, and all of a sudden, he starts covering stuff up, right? And so I didn't realize what I had, you know, naked guy walking around the garden. That was utopia, right? That's not what we're talking about here, right? This, that's just wrong on a whole lot of levels, right? But uh, this is not what is happening with Eve. Eve didn't eat the apple, and all of a sudden, Adam got sexy, right? Sin didn't enter the world and bring sexy back. This is not how this all worked <laughs> together, right? This is something unique. This is something that's different. The more accurate reading is this, is re- this relationship is going to get distorted in its design. So the, 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 your desire will be for your husband's position, right? Your, your desire will be to be over your husband. And in fact, um, if there, there might be a footnote in your Bible that this word for can be also be translated against, and that's a more accurate rendition. So that your desire will be, in fact, against your husband. See, that's, this is where this makes sense when we begin to see sin enters the world and there begins an, to be an upsetting in the order that God created in this way. And, and this responds with this idea that your husband will rule over you. That's a distortion. We talked about that last week. That's a distortion of God's intent in this. And so God's intent is that, God, uh, that guys would have this loving, sacrificial, humble leadership of, uh, of a woman, not a rule over kind of. That's the distortion. But it should be a humble others-centered sacrificial leadership. And in this, the right way for this to be working in terms of design is for women to be able to respond to that in a, in a way that, uh, that accelerates this whole thing together. So this is the distortion that happens in this. When we begin to see this played out, we see verses like Proverbs 21, 19, it says this. This is the distortion, right? Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. And so this is a guy saying to another guy, hey, you know what? When it gets like that, when it gets distorted, I'm just moving to the desert, right? I'm, I'm getting out of here. So the other side is when we talk about all of these, these are these sinful realities. This is, in the, this is what the Bible speaks into. So the rest of the Bible is, is taking this and is, is pointing back to the fall, is pointing back into this understanding. And so last week we talked about what biblical masculinity looked like. We looked at what godly masculinity looks like and discovered that it was rooted in Christ's action towards the church. Specifically, godly masculinity is motivated by the sacrificial love of Christ and mimics this initiating sacrificial love specifically for husbands towards their wives. And even more specifically, this looks like men accepting the responsibility through leading protecting and providing. And so if, with that understanding of masculinity, what is the reciprocal femininity? What does that look like? How is that to be your son? That's the question that we have to answer today. What is this? I, I think oftentimes we ask, uh, what should a woman do? What is her roles? But I think it's far more helpful for us to ask, what is a woman? What is her design? Why did God place women in our midst? And so we're going to explore that. And to explore that, we're going to go to the second chapter of femininity, the introduction of woman. And so in the second chapter of Genesis, what we're going to see in verse 18 is what happens uh, when things are not going well. God said, hey, that's not good. And so I'm going to win woman to save the day. Okay. So verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make, and here we begin, here we begin to see this, I will make a helper suitable for him. A helper. Yay. That's ex- an inspiring word, ladies. Am I right? You know, uh, this is what my, my little girl longs for. Uh, this idea of being a helper. 
this is, this is what I, I get frustrated sometimes because our translations are so weak in this. And if we were to be people that understood this word in its original language, uh, I don't think there would be so many things that would fight against this idea. You see, this idea in the original Hebrew, the word is ezer. And ezer it has this word of helper, but it's, it's more specifically this idea of sustainer beside him sustainer beside him. And here's what you begin to see, some, some context for this. The word ezer is used only 20 other places in the entire Old Testament. And in every other instance, the person being described as the ezer is God himself. This is when you need him to come through desperately. And so what we begin to see is Ezer is only used twice in the Genesis creation narrative, specifically pointed towards women. And then throughout the rest of scripture, it is used as a military um, term. It is used as a term of uh, a warrior in, in protecting in this kind of way, uh, in a way that is, is, is helping and coming alongside. It is not a weak word. Uh, an Ezer is someone who is for you. And a woman as an Ezer reflects God as an Ezer, as an ally, someone who nurtures and brings strength in this. This is a powerful, powerful term about how something comes along for something greater. In the New Testament, this idea of helper, this is, we, we get the word paraclete. So paraclete is the word that is, that is kind of the synonymous word here. But this is the word that is used to describe the Holy Spirit, the person of the Trinity. Jesus says, I've come and I've done my thing and now I'm going to leave and I'm going to go back to heaven and I'm going to bring something. It's better that I go because there'll be someone more powerful who is going to come in your midst and that is the helper. That is the paraclete. That is the Holy Spirit. And when we begin to get this, we begin to understand that the role of the Holy Spirit is, is to be responsive to the Father and responsive to the people that is helping. So this is this beautiful thing. This is a beautiful moment where we begin to see the power in this, where we begin to understand that the heart of this, that we don't see the Holy Spirit as any part less of the Trinity, but something it's crucial into the whole Godhead to make this work. And if I was trying to think about uh, what does it look like? What's, a, what's, a, what's an idea that illustrates this? And, and, and there's this um, picture of, uh, of the flying buttress. Maybe you don't know what a flying buttress is, uh, but I want to show you up on, the, uh, up on the screen. It's this sense of, uh, this is typically seen in cathedrals, right? And they build these very tall, right? In, in order to be able to, uh, to push up towards the heaven, to be able to get a sense of spirituality, pushing towards God. And what is required is the load paths. It, it, you can't go high without having something that's alongside of that. And so what you see is these flying buttresses that come alongside and begin to say, in order for this to accomplish its purpose, this cannot happen without the flying buttress. And this is, is a picture. And there, there's another picture of how it looks like maybe in a more realistic kind of way. But this is the essence of what God is calling, what, what, God, what, what it looks like for us to be people that connect to this calling. And, and this is what it is, ladies, that throughout Scripture, in various ways, it points to women as being responsive to godly masculinity. See, this is, this is the, the, this action for, for us, or I'm sorry, not for us, but for you as women. This is this action for you to say in, the, in light of a godly masculinity, of a sacrificial understanding of who they are because of the gospel towards me. It is the response. It is my, it is my role, it is my function to be able to respond in this kind of way. So that at the heart of a woman is her responsiveness to the sacrificial love displayed for her and to her. And so if we were kind of put this in the same kind of category as we did for masculinity, godly, a godly woman is to be responsive by being available to be led, protected, and provided for. Again, this is not because of capacity. This is because of calling. And you might think like, you know what? If there was a man who treated me like that, I would just naturally go towards that. And that would seem like a no-brainer. But this is an issue in our world because of pride because of fear, but more specifically, I believe, because we have an absence of an understanding of what it actually means for us to live in the image of God, in the imago Dei is what we said it, that when women don't understand that their value comes from God alone, 
they will seek it in something else. And if being led by someone else, by a man, appears to be a place where they ascribe less to themselves, then no matter how godly this man is, they simply won't respond to this kind of man. And this kind of woman will choo typically choose a passive mate. And as we saw last week, that the passivity of men is the root of all ungodly masculinity. And so here's the hope, is that godly femininity responds to godly masculinity. In the face of sacrificial love, a woman allows herself to be loved. She allows herself to be lovingly, sacrificially led, protected, and provided for. And whenever a man leads a woman like this and sacrifices for her, and she responds negatively towards that, she responds in a disrespectful, disrespectful kind of way. I promise you, ladies, it's like a dagger to the heart of a man. And it opens up a deep wound of disrespect in this. And this is not, again, because they're of any less value or any less capacity as a leader or anything like this. This is you taking the heart of Jesus on. In Philippians 2, we see Jesus comes and he gives up voluntarily some aspects of his deity in order to accomplish something greater. He, he said, I'm going to give up this to accomplish this. This is, ladies, this is you being Jesus. Men, you have an opportunity to be Jesus as well because of this self-sacrificial love that Jesus had for his church as he gave his life up for her to put her first. And the beauty of this works together is what Paul's talking about when he begins to paint the picture of these roles and he starts off and saying, it should be mutually submissive to each other. That men, you should be submissive to women in that you put them first in the sacrificial love. That ladies, you should be submissive to men in that you would say, I have the availability, I'm humbly yielding to allow you to lead me in this kind of way. And this is this beautiful picture. And ladies, you might be saying, yeah, that would be easy. Keith, where are those guys? Where have you stashed those guys away? Where, where does this look like? That's a unicorn, right? That's a unicorn kind of dude, right? I don't know if I've found that. But I think that we should start pushing towards this. And here's what I believe, women, that you've, you've been uniquely called to pull out in the heart of a man godly masculinity by reflecting the characteristics of God. And, and so I want to go through three characteristics of God that you women possess. Three characteristics of God that women possess. And, and, I, and I want you to see this. And these are going to be on a continuum because there might be some men that possess some of these characteristics and there might be some women that possess or don't possess many of these characteristics. But I want us to see these. There's two categories on kind of a sliding scale here that when we begin to think about this, women, you should be pointing towards these things. This is the characteristic of God that you uniquely can demonstrate. And men, here's characteristics of God that you can uniquely um, you, you can uniquely demonstrate. But then we're pulling apart from this so we can clearly see masculinity and femininity in the way that reflects God's character. The first thing is we begin to think about what it looks like, what are characteristics that God, of God that women possess. It's this, that godly femininity reveals God's relational character. That godly femininity reveals God's relational character. That ladies, that God has placed within you a greater desire towards relational connection. We see this from the very beginning as the creation of woman has relationship all over it. As we begin to see the curse has relationship all over it. At the very core, the relational capacity of women exceeds the relational capacity of men. Their ability to connect, their ability to go deeper, it is, it is a deeper understanding of relationship in this. That ladies, you can sit and talk for hours and you don't need an activity to keep busy. This is very difficult for guys. You know, it's like, let's do something. And maybe on the way, we'll talk about this stuff, right? Um, for, for you ladies, language and being able to interact is a form of relationship building. For, for most men, this is, a, is the sense of getting something done on purpose. There's a purposefulness behind all of this. There's a unique capacity, ladies, that you have for relationship that exceeds that of men. I'm talking in general terms. You might say, I know this one guy who's more relational than this one girl. Yes, but in general, when we begin to understand one of the unique things things that I, ha I think uh, women have is this invitation towards relationship, this connectivity towards other people that push us into being known. And this is essential for our culture. This is essential for our church because if we do not pursue and allow femininity to thrive and flourish, 
then we end up being cold, distant people. See, there's just a, there's a difference. And this, ladies, doesn't mean introvert and extrovert. It's something altogether different. In fact, I have a picture. This, is, this might be what it looks like to have a Facebook profile uh, and you don't check it for a week. Um, just, I thought that was a, this is a funny kind of understanding of what this looks like. Do we have that? Yeah. What happens when you don't go on Facebook for a week? A guy and a, anyway, so that could be something. That might be true uh, of you. Uh, maybe not. So first of all, this understanding of the characteristic of God is revealed in the relational understanding of women. Number two, femininity reveals God's nurturing character. Femininity reveals God's nurturing character. Now, this is pervasive across the Bible, so I can't give you just one text because there's, there's so many of these things over and over and over. Psalm 131, Psalm, uh, Isaiah 66, 13, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, all they paint pictures of this nurturing capacity of women and to see how these reflect the nurturing capacity of women. The Lord. Nurturing is life-giving. Uh, the purpose of nurturing is to create strength in another individual, helping them to be who God intends them to be. Nurturing is equipping others around us to live out their God-given calling, to be a safe, inviting, vulnerable individual, to be able to be someone who allows others to come to them. I promise, generally, when you begin to have uh, femininity on display, it is an inviting thing that, it, that, that desires to nurture and to help them to become who they are. Nurturing has nothing to do with our personality or individual or season of life. If we have this capacity, it is simply put a capacity that every woman possesses because she's an image bearer of God and God is a nurturing God and his character is on display in femininity. And this is a crucial thing for us to begin to understand God because we under, begin to understand that the heart of most men, women is a nurturing heart. And one of the things that I think that we do in, in terms of relationship, in terms of nurturing, is that when this is not put on display to the extent that it should be put on display, everything moves, and I, I begin to think about our songs and preaching, towards this, uh, this really feminization of who God is, that we're always talking about God as being, uh, hey, God wants to, God loves you so much. Um, and, and that's very true. And God, God wants to be in a relationship with you. And, and, and God desires to know your hurts. And, and all of these are these, this, these feminine qualities. But I've seen myself, because I think the attack on femininity has, has, has its effects upon our society, that the way that we view God, we're having to overcorrect on the feminine side because we've lost some femininity in our culture. When I begin to think back in, in cultures where it was more evenly balanced, we begin to see theology that was more evenly balanced in this kind of way. But I feel like I'm always talking about this nurturing side of God to correct what we don't see in the femininity as it begins to reveal the character of God. So women, you have to absolutely be who you are, possessing femininity to be a part of revealing the character of God. This is essential to relational, that you're nurturing, that you're being able to press into people's life, to be inviting people into your life. This is an essence of what it means to be a responsive kind of godly woman in this. Even as a single woman, you can nurture people around you, your love, affection, softness, and care in a way that most men cannot do. And you begin to see this role in a role that uh, pushes people to Christ and helps them to blossom even in their femininity, ladies, with other ladies, as you begin to say, this is a part of the characteristic of God. This is where you get to see and press them into what it means to be beautiful. And that brings me into my, my last kind of point in this, that when we begin to see these, this essence of what it means to be uh, godly in its femininity, it, it's this idea of relational. It's the idea of the characteristic of God by being neutral, nurturing. But it's also in this idea that God's desire, what we begin to see is, is femininity reveals God's desire for beauty. Femininity reveals God's desire for beauty. See, when I begin to think about my guys, uh, my, my boys, and I begin to talk to other parents, uh, there's a sense of, uh, of little boys, when they want my attention, it's always to look, dad, look, look at what I'm doing. Like, look at how far I can throw this thing. Or look how tall I can build this, this building. Or, or look at the size of my poop. Like, you know, it's all this stuff that, 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 that's like, look what I did, dad. Look, look at this, what this looks like. Um, 
It's true. I'm just being straight up. Uh, with, with my little girl, it's, it's not look at what it do, but look at who I am. Like, my boys don't twirl. My little girl twirls, right? And it's much more not look at what I did, look at what I created, but look at who I am. And this is a, a reality that I think that you um, desire. I, I want you to give you a, a quote. I think that there's something in his that, that is incredibly, incredibly uh, oriented towards revealing beauty. Um, it says this, uh, Stacey Eldridge says this, We desire to possess a beauty that is worth pursuing, worth fighting for, a beauty that is at its core who we truly are. We want a beauty that can be seen, a beauty that can be felt, a beauty that can affect others, a beauty all our own to unveil. Ladies, you are the crown of creation. There's nothing that God created that is any more beautiful than who you are. And God created you that way on purpose. It's a little like, you know, the the thermos and the the goblet. You know, guys, let's be honest. You're the thermos, right? Right? This is who you are. And, and, and what you do with thermoses is, you know, when you're done, maybe you just throw them in the back of your car, right? You don't do that with the goblet. Ladies, this is who you are. You are the thing that God has created that he sees as beautiful. You're the crown of creation inside and out. And ladies, what I want you to hear today, I want you, I want you to hear that your heavenly father believes that you are beautiful. I want you to hear your pastor say that to you, that your heavenly father believes that you're beautiful because over and over, I don't believe that many of you really believe that about yourself. I believe that somehow you think, yeah, there's a certain sense of me that that feels beautiful. And when I hear that song on the radio that I don't need anything else, that my beauty is inside of me, that there's something that longs to to believe that. But also there's something that I believe that needs to be added to who I am to make me beautiful or accepted. And that is an absolute lie. That you are beautiful because God made you this way. You're the goblet, not the thermos. Rest assured that that is how God created you. And it's not because of anything that you have to do. And the other thing is I need you to know that this goes beyond the depth of your skin. It goes deeper than your skin. In 1 Timothy 2, he says this, and I want women to be modest in their appearance, that they should wear decent and appropriate clothes and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive uh, or, or expensive clothes. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attracted by the good things that they do. So ladies, you are attractive. God has made you attractive. And that's a sense that there's a, there's a mystique to you that it draws things in that you're inviting people into. But I need you to make sure that the beauty that you possess, that you don't fall into the trap of the tendency to exploit your God-given beauty in this. Because this cheapens the mystery of a woman's beauty. This is what girls do. This is not what women do. Girls dress to draw the eyes of boys. Women dress to protect their hearts and to protect men's hearts. See, when we begin to understand, am I cheapening beauty or am I embracing beauty? This is a core thing about who you are, that God's made you this way. And I want you to, to be drawn to that and not exploit that. Because it, always, it gives back to this image of God thing. That if you believe that boy is going to create you, give you that worth, then you're going to dress to pull that out of him. But if you believe that God believes that, you're going to be a secure and confident woman. And that's what I desire for you to be. Not a crazy woman, but a secure and confident woman. And that your exterior would reflect your interior. And this would be something that guards your heart. Proverbs 4, 23 says this, Above all else, ladies, guard your heart. For it is for, for everything you do flows from it. What you believe about yourself and your heart, are you beautiful? Guard that, protect that, that must be protected. This is what we do with beautiful things in our world, we protect them. We do this with our national parks. When we see something, this is beautiful, this, this shouldn't be exploited, but protected. See, ladies, your beauty isn't a tool, it is to be treasured and protected. 
And if you use this as a tool, then you will draw men, ungodly masculinity, that will exploit that. And this breaks my heart. And this is what I desire for you. That these traits are what reflects the characteristics of God. That, that ladies, I know that when you hear this, for some of you, you're, you're terrified when you hear these things about, about godly femininity responding to godly masculinity because you've been hurt. You've lived in environments where there's been a distorted masculinity, not a godly masculinity. And the last thing that you want to do is let anyone lead you because you've been burned by that before. And if the statistics are correct, one in three of you has been exploited has been taken advantage of sexually, and, and I believe that that's actually pretty low in this land that we live in. And so what, what do you need to hear from your pastor? I, I want to say that I'm deeply sorry that it makes me sick, and it, may, it makes me almost uncontrollably mad when ungodly masculinity takes advantage of femininity. That if I could take and eliminate one sin, it would be this thing. Because it destroys the design of God. It exploits women. It creates hurt that is at the deepest level of most women. All because that the design of God wasn't followed. And people exploited things, distorted things. But what I want to say is that ladies, for those of you who've been hurt by this, and it's really hard to hear some of this stuff, the answer is not to forsake masculinity. The answer is not to give up on being feminine. The answer is to embrace God's design, to hold out for a godly man that you can follow, respond to, be led by, be loved by, and be 100% secure in his arms. It's for you to have the standard of, of, of a godly man that is worth following. This is what our hope is towards. That if you've been hurt in the past, your hope is towards a godly man. And, and, I, and I promise you, the guys, ladies, sorry, this starts right now. It starts with needing God, not needing guys. If you don't fully believe that God gives you worth, even if just a little part of you believe that some guy can give you worth, then whether or not this guy is godly enough is gonna get really fuzzy for you. And you're going to compromise in this kind of, kind of way. If, if you don't believe 100% God gives you this worth, and then when the fuzzies wear off, you're gonna see this guy and whether or not this man will sacrificially love you because the gospel has permeated his soul every part of his life. But the problem is oftentimes it's too late and we engage and we get into these sacrificial, sorry, covenantal relationships in this, in this place. And we're taking and putting on guys something that only God can fill in our hearts. And for you married ladies, here's the thing. If your husband is struggling to love you sacrificially, your complaints alone will not change his heart. Your responsive and your respectful devotion to your husband will do more than you realize to draw out a gospel-motivated sacrificial love. Because here's the reality. When most men realize that they are called to lead, they immediately get incredibly insecure they immediately start thinking, how do I do this? And, and ladies, like we said last week, remember that most men have never seen godly masculinity modeled to them. And so what we're trying to do, ladies, we're doing the best we can. We are uh, putting into, into place places to train guys. We have a boot camp that we do where for 24 hours we yell at them. We yell at them for 24 hours. We make them carry heavy things and chop wood and realize it's not about them. Uh, we, we run around uh, our town carrying bricks. Uh, that is, you know, this, this idea of carrying the weight of responsibility. At the end, we have, them, uh, we have them hold bricks while other men tell them the capacity that they have to leave and the unique things that God has put within them. See, this is what we desire to make this flourish. This is our hope for all of this. 
And I want to give you some specifics in this. Uh, I want you to, to, to get this um, and, and to understand that all of what I'm talking about, it, it really comes from a place that I wish you could see modeled. The problem that I have today is I'm using only words. But let me give you a baseline for what this looks like in my life. I'm married to a woman almost 15 years, and this is an amazing woman. She has uh, multiple degrees. She has a, uh, she has a degree, uh, a graduate degree in theology. Uh, she has a job outside of our home. She doesn't know exactly how to use our vacuum because we split the chores and our domestic responsibilities. Uh, she, she has uh, all of this capacity. She has way more ministry capacity than I do. She is both incredibly relational and incredibly administrative. I am neither relational or administrative. I don't know how I got into this position, right? I don't know what I have to give. My wife is so much more, more uh, competent in this thing, but in order to understand how we live in God's good design, when we have begun to say, not because she doesn't have competence, because of a glad yielding of, uh, of responding to my leadership. This is how our, our world works, and, I, and it is beautiful. And, and I love my marriage, and I, love, and, I, and I believe my wife feels incredibly secure in this. In fact, when, before I left, she said, go tell them what this looks like because it's a beautiful picture. What does it look like to respond in this kind of way? And for you ladies, what does it look like outside of the, of the home? What does it look like as you respond in, in terms of um, responding to, to masculinity outside of, uh, outside of marriage? What I want to say to you is outside of marriage and to a lesser extent outside of the church when men don't step up to lead, this doesn't mean that there's a leadership vacuum. Ladies, you need to step up and lead when there's no men that, is, that are leading in the way that they need to lead. And also, I want you to know that you are not to be submissive to ungodly leadership outside of the home. Now, in a covenantal relationship, we work that out, and that's, that's struggle and stuff like that. But if you have a boss, if there's something else that is, it is in a position above you, you, if they are not living out a godly, sacrificial kind of love, you're not called to submit to them. You're not called to, to, um, to be responsive to that kind of masculinity. This is not the overarching thing that we, you, you need to hear. You need to understand that this is in the context of a godly masculinity in our, our churches and, and in, more specifically in our marriages. And this is what I want to say. It begins for you, the confident display of womanhood begins with this understanding of the image of God being displayed in a humble, yielding way. But the beauty of all of this fits together in the design of masculinity and the design of femininity to paint a bigger picture. And this bigger picture is to paint the way that God receives glory. And so why does femininity exist? Why does masculinity exist? Why does sexuality exist? Why does male and female exist? All of this exists to point towards God's glory. So the end of all of this is not just, okay, here's what I understand and have clarity about as a, as a woman. Here's what I understand and have clarity about as a man. The end of this is that masculinity and femininity and the relationship to each other point specifically to God. It draws out his character and points to a bigger story than just the story between a man and a woman. It is to reveal God's glory. It's pointed to us for us to see God and how God works and the beauty of flourishing that he's given to all mankind, all humans, in order for us to live the way he desires. And so he's saying, marriage, this is a picture of what I want you to see. Femininity, masculinity, it's a picture of something bigger than just gender. It points to the glory of God. And this is the thing, when we begin to see, in the end of Romans 1, when we begin to see femininity degraded, when we begin to see masculinity degraded, what it leads is to social issues. And the breakdown of this leads us to the reality of Romans 1, where it gets pervasive across our culture. It doesn't lead us to flourishing. And so I hear, I hope you hear all of this. And I hope that you begin to say, I desire to live more as a man. I desire to live more as a woman. And to be able to have that worldview to ascribe value to those things because God has given me intrinsic value before all of that. And that ladies, that you would feel honored that God created you as a woman. And that you would feel his pleasure and you will feel his worth and you would feel that you have purpose in all the things that you are called on to display his character. 
So as we conclude, I'd like to, just like I did with the guys last week, I'd like to ask you to stand up. I'd like to pray, ladies, I'd like to ask you to stand up, and I want to pray over you as we conclude this. So it'll be guys that come up here uh, to, to lead us in worship. But, uh, but I want to end today and just, um, and just to pray over you, ladies. So if you're a lady here, uh, I just want to, again, to pray over you in this way. So if you'll join me in prayer. God, I, I ask that you would help us to understand that being made in your image has incredible implications, God. And that, Lord, across this room, that there would be ladies that feel more like a woman than they ever have before. That there is a validation to this. That there is something that they see that maybe they've never seen to the extent that they do now. That you have a beautiful plan and that plan is that you would draw out what you've put within them for the glory of yourself, Lord. For your glory and for the flourishing of all mankind, Lord. So may we walk in that and embrace femininity. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen.